even more wonderful coming today. It's my very great honor and privilege to introduce our keynote speaker for our retreat, Kate Hines. Yeah. Kate has been leading AWA workshops for more than 20 we years. Your, we couldn't wait till your... Uh... She's a longtime member of the AWA board. She was a close colleague, associate, and friend of Pat Schneider's. Um, they worked together on a project that they called Writing Across Race, which was interesting and revealing for both of them. Kate is a fellow of Cave Canem, which is the National Foundation for the Development of, and Support of Established and Emerging African American Poets. Her poems have been published in several anthologies, most recently, Slant of Light, a contemporary women, men, women's writers of the Hudson Valley. Kate lives in New Paltz, New York. She has a master's in American Lit, and she's been a teacher of writing and communication, not only for AWA groups, but for many years at Hudson Valley area colleges and community colleges. Um, I have admired Kate since the very first time I met her at Pat's house, and I value so much the perspective that she has brought to the board of directors for many, many years, but particularly in the past year or two. So thank you, Kate, and I will be quiet. I'm looking forward to hearing you. Good morning, everyone. Well, uh, this is indeed um, an honor to have been asked to do the keynote um, this year. And um, a real challenge for me as well. Pat Schneider, Amherst Writers and Artists founder, my sister friend and mentor died less than two months ago. With every word and line I have attempted to write for today, I have heard Pat's voice. My words today are filled with her words and the images of her that rose up when I began to write. I will open with the reading of a poem by Pat. The title of this poem, and it's not one of Pat's better known poems, but it's a fun one, is what I want to say. Well, I was playing, see, in the shadow of the tabernacle. I was decorating mud pies with little brown balls I found scattered on the ground like nuts or berries until some big boy came walking by and laughed. Hey, don't you know you're putting goat dew on your mud pies? I bet you're gonna eat them too. That day, I made a major error in my creative life. What I want to say is this. I like those little balls on my mud pies. I was a sculptor, an artist, an architect. I was making pure design in space and time. But I quit because a critic came along and called it shit. This is Pat at her playful and irreverent best. The line that stays with me, that day I made a major error in my creative life. The day I met Pat and immersed myself in Amherst writers and artists, I made the best decision 
in my creative life. I heard Pat before I met her. She was being interviewed on a radio broadcast about the Chicopee Women's Writing Workshop, a workshop for low-income women living in public housing in Chicopee, Massachusetts. I had just begun working as director of a professional development project serving teachers who instructed adult students. Much like the women Pat described during the interview, I was intrigued by writing as a means to change lives, to bring about personal and social change. Even more importantly, the possibility that writing could sustain and grow change over years. Pat was confident that the written voice can bring about change. I wanted to know more. I followed up with a phone call and an invitation to lead a workshop in, for New York State adult educators. I met Pat February 4th, 1994, along with Anise Santiago, her co-workshop leader and member of the original Chicopee Women Writers Workshop. I can only be this specific about the time because in preparing to speak today, I took every Pat Schneider volume I possess from my bookshelves. One of them, the writer as artist, a new approach to writing alone and with others, 1993, is inscribed by Pat and David. The writer as artist lays out the AWA blueprint. Pat trial tested new and effective writing workshop practices. A fellow writer, mentor, and friend, Margaret Robeson, perceived the experience of writing in the Yellow House at 77 McClellan Street was unlike any writing workshop or creative writing class she had ever taken. She prodded Pat to commit to paper the practices and principles we know as the Amherst Writers and Artists Method. Lucky for us, Pat couldn't keep it to herself. She wrote books, gave lectures, led trainings to pass the method along to others. She wrote, you can write alone and with others. It is true. You can make alone time and space to write. You can go on solitary retreats. You can make the AWA principles and practices your very own. Pat, in her two books on the method, gives writers more than a year's worth of exercises to spark memory or imagination. With Pat's books as your guide, and a commitment to write with frequency and consistency, you will be surprised by the poems and stories that come forth. As fantastic as that is, you may feel like a cook who has prepared a gourmet meal for one. You may savor every word and turn a phrase you may toast yourself, but if there are no glasses to clink, a writer may lose herself and ask herself, why bother? One of the most frequent comments I hear from writers in my workshops is, I don't write alone. I only write here in workshop. I tell them the solitary writer is a, com is a romantic conceit of the privileged and elite. 
Pat wanted a space where everyone could write. A good workshop is one that makes a writer want to write. AWA doesn't just have practices. AWA is writing practice. AWA survives and thrives in community. Writing and sharing what we write encourages a sense of community that promotes openness, respect, and creativity. Pat rewrites the romantic conceit of writing in solitude. Not as writing alone, but as writing with others. She says, solitude does not mean being physically alone. Thousands of times I have been in a writing workshop where we write together in silence. A kind of silence happens there where each of us works silently and protects the other's privacy. In that setting, miracles happen. The writer writes clear, clean narrative, surprising juxtapositions, metaphoric images, insights that the writer himself or herself does not perceive until it is read aloud and named by listeners. For many writers in today's world, that solitude in the company of other writers is the only solitude we give ourselves. Just as Pat re-envisions the nature of solitary writing, she also abandoned the male metaphors of self-reliance and self-imposed solitude. She wrote, what we do when we write, we bend down at the river bank of our life stream, we squat unashamed of our body shape, claiming our own form. We bend, we squat, we push our hands into the mud of our own life story. Everything that happens to us, everything we have ever imagined, everything we have dreamed, desired, feared, longed for. Everything we have touched, tasted, seen, heard, smelled, all of it, rich muck, that loam, that clay we claim as the material of our art. The supply is infinite. We carry not only our stories, but the stories of our mothers, our fathers, and their mothers and fathers all the way back beyond recorded time to the dim beginnings of consciousness and beyond that to the creatures we once were. Our stories come through us. They are evidence that we are connected across generations. They connect us to past, present, and future. Before Hillary Clinton popularized the African proverb, Pat understood that it takes a village. Her metaphor of giving birth, of treating new writing as a newborn, informs our roles as AWA workshop leaders. We create and maintain safe spaces where new writing can be ushered into the world. Bor birthing, bringing forth new life, isn't just woman's work. We all, regardless of sex or gender identity, have a responsibility to welcome and nurture new life, new writing. One of Pat's favorite prompts 
close your eyes, but only if you feel comfortable to do so. And find yourself standing in a doorway, in an upstairs hallway, a big chair, a front porch, a swing, a secret place. What is the quality of light in front of you? What is the quality of light behind you? Is anyone near you? Or are you alone? Pat wrote in response to this prompt hundreds of times over the years. So often that at times she seems frustrated with finding herself in the same place over and over. It is always the same goddamned hallway. Rather than stay with that frustration, she writes, I will make myself a hallway. Let it be light. Let there be sun falling through a window and carpeting a stair. For me, it will always be the same goddamned hallway. When I close my eyes, it is the hallway I enter when I push open the door of the yellow house. I enter the hallway Pat created, not just for herself, but for every hesitant writer, for every, recur for every recovering MFA graduate, for anyone who has ever been told, you know, you should really write that down. The light carpeting the stairs emanates from a generous window at the top of the staircase. On an adjacent wall, a framed print of an open window, white curtains blowing in the breeze, a solitary chair. Pat's poem, The Patience of Ordinary Things, inspired the painter, Fanny Rush, to create a hallway. A slant of light falls across the dark painted wooden deacon's bench on the downstairs wall opposite the staircase. In the doorway, Pat appears, her smile as generous as the light from the upstairs window. She welcomes each writer into the room where it happens. A large room with two generous windows illuminating the space with the magic of New England light. The light that inspired the first dame of Amherst, a favorite of Pat's, Emily Dickinson. Beneath one window, a table with a small vase of freshly cut garden flowers, a circle of chairs, rockers, a kitchen chair or two, a vintage wingback chair, a Scandinavian settee, from the kitchen, the AWA signature smell of freshly baked brownies. Everyone has a strong, unique voice. Pat believed that the art of writing belonged to the people rather than a select group of the privileged or those deemed gifted. Every person can use art can use words to make art. Everyone is born with creative genius. Anyone who can tell a story can write a story or have their story recorded for them. We learn story as we listen to lullabies and nursery rhymes, a reading of Good Night Moon, or through the cracked opening are through the cracked opening of a bedroom door as the sound, as we listen to the sound of grown up voices telling one another the stories of their day. We listen to story at kitchen tables from the back seats of cars, our first invitation to tell our own. Tell me, 
How was your day? What did you do at school? Every person can write to understand themselves, others, and to make sense of the world. The teaching of craft can be done without damage to a writer's original voice or artistic self-esteem. One day at school, an English teacher places a C at the top of a page where you wrote a story about the joy you had visiting grandma in Sunday, uh, in summer, your cousins down south, or your first trip to the ocean. We learn that mature writing, school writing, real writing, is valued more than story. The cross T's and the dotted I's, a correctly placed comma, is more valuable than vivid language. To earn the all important A, write with a clear beginning, a middle, and an end. Follow the formula and don't stray. Meanwhile, we keep to ourselves the scribbled, messy pages of poems and stories. We tuck those handwritten pages in notebooks between, beneath pillows, mattresses, and at the bottom of underwear drawers. Writing becomes our secret place. We play grown up. We tell the world to go to hell. We pray to be saved from the lives we know. We whine, we dream. Writing as an art form belongs to all people, regardless of economic class or educational level. You may have confessed once that you like to write, not school writing, but stories and poems. In response to that claim, many of us are warned, you can't make a living doing that you'll grow out of it or with gracious solicitude oh that's a nice hobby or maybe you were challenged and confronted who do you think you are what makes you think you can be a writer a writer is someone who writes one day, I found myself in the hallway of the Yellow House at 77 McClellan Street, and I claimed writing as my art. Pat was the bravest writer in the room. While some of us dangled our fingers over the sides of our boats, skimmed the surfaces of our lives, Pat modeled for us the words she wrote in her poem, Your Boat, Your Words. Belief is the only wind with breath enough to take you past the deadly calms, the stopped motion, toward that place you have imagined, the existence of which you cannot prove except by going there. Pat went there. She climbed over the side of her boat, immersed herself deep ever, in ever deepening waters. I can hear her laughter as I describe her immersion as a kind of baptism. She plunged her depths and rose with her face drenched in tears of grief, sadness, laughter. In the circle of chairs, I sat wondering, how did she do that? I sat wondering, how do I find the words to say what stays with me? Gradually, we become courageous. The writers in the room take the plunge. This room is safe. We practice being, every, being one another's lifeline, 
by treating all writing as fiction, by listening for what is strong, by responding with empathy, encouragement, compassion. What stays with me today? The way Pat, the many ways Pat breathed life into AWA's written principles and practices. At the conclusion of a workshop or training, the writers frequently gathered on the steps of the Yellow House while Peter, Pat's beloved, took photos of our newly formed community. Then we returned to the room to collect our notebooks, laptops, purchase another volume of Pat's writing to add to our libraries. We lingered in the hallway, reluctant to say goodbye. I learned that goodbyes in the hallway turned out to be more like, I'll see you next time. Over the years, my path crossed multiple times with AWA workshop leaders and writers who, like me, had found themselves in Pat's hallway. Close your eyes, but only if you are comfortable doing so, and find yourself standing in the hallway of the Yellow House at 77 McClellan Street. Imagine this virtual space as an extension of that hallway. As an AWA workshop leader, Pat's hallway is your inheritance. Amherst writers and artists thrives because of you. Workshop leaders who create and maintain writing workshops where writers can plunge into deep waters. You show writers how to extend a lifeline to one another so that they can trust their imaginations and memories, to bring up memories from the depths of their unconscious, and to trust their unique voices to articulate those images. We keep their boats and their words safe. This is how we break silence. And I will conclude by reading another of Pat's poems. To break silence. To break silence is to shatter the, shatter the glass invisible wall. Between the waters of dreams and the waters of waking in the blue and green denial of connection. To break silence is to be on the far side of the gate to the garden of origin, fallen. To consciousness, angel and flaming sword held against the possibility of innocence. To break silence is to take upon oneself the burden of one's name, called. Nothing now derivative is to turn to face the presence in the primal wilderness of creation. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, now we're moving into um, a Q&A uh, portion that um, Kelsey, our wonderful tech person, has agreed to facilitate for us or to help Kate with. So we're going to use the chat. Um, if you want to put your questions there, Kelsey will read and pull and um, read them aloud to Kate. So um, take it away, chat folks. <laughs>
All right, so so far we have a lot of outpouring of support and excitement for how lovely <laughs> that speech was. Um, we do have one question from Ruth asking what your favorite Pat Schneider book is. Um, actually, my favorite collection of Pat's poetry is her last collection of poetry, The Weight of Love. My favorite, just a second so I get the title correct. Uh, my favorite uh, book of prose of, of hers is How the Light Gets In, Writing a Spiritual Practice. Pat and I um, would often have conversations about that aspect of both of our lives and the role that um, our spiritual lives played in our writing lives. Beautiful. And then I think someone else was wondering what the title of the poems that you read, what those titles were. Okay, I'll have to let me see. Let me go back and see if I can. Um, the last one I read, okay. The two poems I read in full are from Pat's collection called Another River. And the title of the last one is To Break Silence. And the title of the first one is What I Want to Say. And actually I drew from both of those poems for uh, my title for uh, today's presentation. Wonderful. Um, Annie wants to know, what do you see ahead for the AWA legacy with a wounded world? Oh, my goodness, that's a biggie. Uh, <laughs> That is a big one. That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> I think it would just be simply to carry forward the um, the work that that Pat started, because Pat very much um, felt that writing had a significant place in how we go about changing um, the world. Uh, she often would write about, not in terms of um, what she liked about story and poem, was that they took us to the particular. And in the particular, there's a passage in one of her books, for example, and I, and I can't remember which one it is at the moment, where she writes about um, that it's almost meaningless to write about uh, hunger, for example, or famine. People hear that so often it just flies past them. It has meaning. But instead, if you are, if you begin with a description of a child with a distended belly, barefoot, flies flying all around that child, that what comes up first is a human response. Emotion kicks in before the intellect kicks in. And I suspect if we can provide more of that kind of writing into the world, that just as Pat had confidence in the ability of good writing to change individuals, and to change the larger society that that would be AWA's contribution and to pro provide that um, opportunity for as many people as possible from as many different backgrounds as possible. Um, until fairly recent, the canon of American writing had largely been white and male. That is beginning to change. But it still is a canon that doesn't reflect many, many voices. And part of what AWA can do, because it exists outside of academia, is that it can open its doors 
to a wide variety, a great diversity of writers with other stories to tell. Wonderful. And um, so moving on from that, Irene is wondering, what is the most encouraging thing Pat ever said to you? Oh, goodness. You're a writer. <laughs> and um, Diane's wondering, what type of groups do you lead and how have they changed in the last year or two? Um, I lead workshops under the auspices of Walk Hill Valley Writers and Artists, and that's in the Hudson Valley in upstate uh, New York. And um, I started with one, and then it became two, and then it became three. Um, and most often those workshops took place in the space that you're seeing behind me, which is my living room. Um, but in the past six months, the workshops have gone online. And one of the things that has happened as a result of the workshops, there are th still three of them, but one of the changes is that um, they're no longer just Hudson Valley people. Um, there I have writers who had moved away from the area and couldn't participate, and they now participate once again. I have uh, writers currently taking, uh, in, in, the, in the three workshops that I'm doing, let's see, I have Pennsylvania, Arizona, Canada, Connecticut. So that's been kind of fun, getting and people who have written in the workshop telling a friend who lives on is that oh this would be a good idea to do so that's this, that's the biggest change sue says i loved your mentioning of the writer as an artist that was my first intro to her too could you comment on the comparison between that first book and her next version writing alone and with others the first book, oh, and here in case anyone, I'll try to hold it up. Hopefully people can see it. You can see it's a rather beat up old copy. <laughs> and since I referred to it, I don't know how well you'll be able to see this, but that's Pat's inscription in the first book. And I hadn't looked at it in a while, so I was surprised when I saw it and saw that it was dated. And I said, oh, aha, now I know. <laughs> um, as in uh, uh, what I said is, is that um, this first volume really is more of a blueprint is where she begins to lay out her ideas about what um writing alone and with others might possibly be and how that uh would happen this is in many ways i find more uh descriptive than the other book, uh, Writing Alone and with Others. Um, the, other, the other book is, uh, how do I, it's more thoughtful about the process. It too contains a lot of description and also the second volume, she's learning, she's constantly learning as she's doing the process. Every time she leads a workshop, every time she trains uh, workshop leaders, um, Pat is, in, is engaged in 
her own ongoing reconsideration and conversation about the AWA method. So from my perspective, I find the second book even though there, there are lots of places of overlap, the first is much more descriptive, like this is what I do and this is how you do it. And the second one has that aspect as well, but it's also much more thoughtful uh, than the first volume. What was it like for you to teach your first AWA workshop? Well, the very first workshop wasn't all that terribly successful. <laughs> <laughs> you put the word out there, you keep your fingers crossed, and you hope for the best. And uh, when I put, um, when I did my first workshop, I put the word out there, and I got two people. <laughs> they seem to enjoy it. <laughs> but you keep going. Yeah, that's great. Um, do you write with specific groups or just with anyone who wants to write? My groups are, this is uh, how my workshops um, work. Um, no, they're not specific. I have in the past written with specific groups um, early on as a workshop leader. I led writing workshops. Uh, at Bedford Correctional Facility, which is the only uh, maximum security facility in New York State for women. And uh, I would make time, and because I considered it part of my job, I would make time in the job that I was doing, and also because I just missed being with uh, students. I would also work into my job description, as I saw it, leading workshops, not for teachers, but for adult students who were in adult education classes. So I did that uh, as well. So those would be specific groups, but generally the Walk Hill Valley Writers Workshops are, are open to, to anyone who wants to enroll. Carla says, question, I love the title of your talk, Breaking the Silence. I'm wondering what advice you have for us in terms of taking that idea out into the world as it is now. Well, um, one of the ways that I think uh, a workshop leader can successfully get that out into the world, and, and a number of my writers here do that, and I encourage them to do that, is to go out and read, is to go out and read their work in public. And if you want to have, okay, this is, you know, sort of a little behind the scenes backstory thing. Uh, if you, if, if, if as a workshop leader, you can steer the stories and poems that come up in your workshop by the nature of the prompts that you use. So that if you would like to have uh, your writers writing about issues of gender, find poems, find prompts, that become invitations so that your writers can be open to writing about that. If you want to write about issues of race or police brutality, you can find poems in particular, you can find poems, uh, look at con a lot of contemporary African-American writers. Uh, you can find poems, you can find quotes that address that. Um, one that I find circulates on the internet a lot lately and one that 
um, that comes to mind uh, is is a is a Langston Hughes poem. Let America be America again is a good example of such a poem that opens up that kind of space for writers. And then, as writers write their stories in your workshops. Encourage them to go out and read their stories in public spaces. And if there are no public spaces where you are, where you can read, then make you, where they can read, then make your own. We've done that in Walk Hill Valley Writers as well. Sometimes we've just hosted our own readings and the readers would invite their friends and neighbors, et cetera. Irene would like to know, what is the biggest challenge that you have confronted in facilitating workshops? Okay, for me, that's a personal challenge. Um, um, six uh, years ago, um, uh, my husband was diagnosed with a, um, with a blood cancer. And it involved many, many trips um, to New York City. And I wasn't sure what was going to happen um, with the workshops. Uh, it was definite that they could not happen here in my home. Um, and writers, I had a number of writers in my workshop who opened their homes as spaces where we could have, where we could continue the workshop um, during that time. And they took care of everything that needed to be taken care of. All I had to do was, um, was show up. And so I was, that for me was the biggest challenge. And that actually went on for about two years, period of time. Nancy would like to know if you could share some of your favorite writing prompts. Oh, I don't know. Huh, I wasn't prepared for that one. Uh, <laughs> Here's one of the things I will tell you. Here's standard practice in my workshop. Um, in the trainings and in, um, in my trainings with Pat and other AWA trainings I participated in, um, one of the suggestions for prompts was, you know, if you, if you read a poem that you like, and there's a favorite line or something that stands out for it, use that line. Well, eventually I came to the understanding, wait a minute, that's my favorite line. That might not be somebody else's favorite line. So if I came across a poem that I really like, if it's not too long, my practice is to read the entire poem and to Tell writers to listen to what stands out for them, what stays for them, what sparks imagination or memory for them. I may tell them why I chose that particular poem or what line stood out for me. I also tell them just to sit back, take the poem in as a whole, and then write whatever comes up. And even if they don't have a clue why it came up, write it. <laughs> awesome, so I think that's everything that's in the chat as of now. Um, everyone, you can still, we have a couple more minutes if anyone has any questions that you wanna drop in there, but as of now, it looks like we're about caught up. Oh wait, we got one, we got one from Annie um, who asks, how do you renew your leader energy? Uh, in terms of my workshops, I've always given myself a two week break in between, um, 
in between workshops. And the two weeks is just enough time so that um, by the end of that two week period, I miss it and I want to get back <laughs> to do it, to leading workshops. Because sometimes, to be perfectly honest, by the end I do, I used to do 10, I now do eight week sessions. By the end of the eight week session, I was a little dragging. And then I have that two week break and then I'll get started. And, and by the time it's the two weeks are over, I'm, I'm ready to go. It's such a part of my life that I really, really, really miss it when it's not there. And I will tell you that the past six months, it has been critical to have that for me. Oh. <laughs> uh, it looks like, I think Catherine had a question to do with uh, the prompt, just to follow up on that. She asks, um, would you simply read the poem or give them a copy of the poem? My practice is to read the poem aloud. Oh, I see Katie gave my work. This is totally off that subject, but I see Katie just put the uh, Walk Hill Valley Writers uh, Workshop. I have lots of work to do on my, <laughs> on my site. So thank you, Katie. That'll be a prompt for me to go and do some work at walkhillvalleywriters.com. <laughs> So if you if if you go there, <laughs> it's gonna look a little blank. Don't worry about it. It'll get better. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, um, adv advice for a brand new facilitator. Um, for a brand new facilitator, hang in there. Pat wrote two books because, as I said. She learned as she went alone. You will too. You don't know it all when you get started. Your writers will teach you. That's beautiful. Um, okay, Sue says, would you please talk a little bit about that courageous experiment you and Pat led where white and black women wrote together? Okay, that... That started in a, a conversation Pat and I were having, uh, and it was um, approaching the 50th year anniversary of um, the beginning of the Birmingham bus boycott. And we, in talking about it, we realized that um, women who remembered how race was lived prior to 1955, th that there weren't many, there were probably a declining number of them. So uh, that's where the project started. We wanted to collect the stories, et cetera. And then as the stories started coming in, we saw certain patterns in um, the writing that was presented um, to us. And we weren't able to find um, a publisher for that anthology. I'm not so sure it would be as difficult now as it was then. But at the time, it was really difficult for, for a variety of reasons. But anyway, um, and we wanted to do something with this collection of stories that we had and to bring women together um, across race to write stories. Because one of the things that we discovered in reading those pieces is how little we talked across race about life and the way we actually lived it. There were things white women writers 
would write in those pieces that they sent to us, even though they knew those pieces were going to be public, that they probably would not have written in a workshop where they knew they were going to be in conversation um, with, um, you know, with women of another race. And to some degree, the same thing um, happened with, um, with the writing of African-American women. And we felt really strongly that this is a conversation that doesn't need to be siloed, that we need to talk to one another. And so that's where the idea grew for doing those workshops. And we did a limited number of those, um, but we, we both felt good about the work we were doing. Awesome. So I think, again, we are just about all caught up on the questions. We're running a bit low on time, so um, I might toss this back to Katie Frank. Good. Sure. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. And thank you so much, Kate, for answering all the questions we peppered you with and for writing such a beautiful keynote and giving us so much inspiration to go into this day and tomorrow with. Um, very, very, very grateful to you. And um, to everyone else, we're about to take an hour break for lunch um, and we'll be back 